you, Mike. Uh, can you all hear me? If I stay here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for that nice introduction, Mike. And thank you all for the privilege of, of letting me speak today to this August group. I need to thank Russell Smith and Steve Anderson for allowing me to use some of their wonderful art. And my friend, uh, my German friend Bruno Schmeling for contributing some really terrific photos. And before I start, I'd just like, in my small way, to um, dedicate this presentation to two of our members who have passed away since we last met two years ago. And those are um, my dear, dear friend Dieter Groschel, Dr. Dieter Groschel, who I miss every day, and of course Javier Arango. And uh, I'm sure you miss, many of you miss them as much as I do. Okay. Ernst Udet. How many of you have heard of Ernst Udet? Uh, <laughs> five days from now, September 26th, is the 100th anniversary of a fairly significant event in the career of Ernst Udet, the top, a top German fighter race and one of World War I's most engaging personalities. On this day, on that day in 1918, Udet was credited with downing two DH-9 bombers. These were his final victories and brought his total score to 62. Um, this photo was taken about that time, maybe uh, about a month later at Metz Airfield. His 62nd victory solidified Udet's standing as the highest scoring surviving German ace of the First World War. Uh, and his total was only surpassed among German fighter pilots by Richthofen, of course. Unlike Richthofen, Udet survived the war and built on his reputation in Germany by becoming a celebrated aircraft constructor, an international aerobatics performer, a test pilot, a globe-trotting adventurer, uh, a motion picture stunt pilot and actor, and one of the most popular aviation figures in Europe during the 20s and 30s. More than anything else, he was a passionate flyer. He was also a man of many abilities and, okay, there we go. Many talents, uh, many uh, abilities. One of the best descriptions of Udet was written by Carl Zuckmeyer, who was later to become a renowned German playwright. And in 1918, Zuckmeyer was serving in a field artillery unit at the front, and he encountered Udet. He wrote, I met a sharp, restless, wiry, ebullient, and unusually humorous, often extremely witty, flying white knight who had been offered, honored with the Par le Marit, Ernst Udet. We hit it off after our first few words and drank our first bottle of cognac together. Udet was a heavy drinker from early on. <laughs> kind of like some people I can mention in here. <laughs> Never. Nah. Now, the French aeronautical journalist Jacques Mortin, ed editor of La Guerre Ariane and later La Vie Ariane, met Udet after the war and wrote this in 1926. Oberleutnant Udet, ace of aces of the German Air Force, succeeded Captain Richthofen during the war. He was always loyal and chivalrous. The French airmen, whom he shot down and who were made prisoners, agreed that the conqueror behaved toward them like a gentleman. He went to see them carrying candies and tobacco, asking them for letters to their parents, which he undertook to drop behind French lines from his plane. He defended his flag. It was his duty. And at a different time, Mortan wrote, Furthermore, he's a pilot about whom I've never heard anything disparaging. The airmen who were down by him affirmed that he was a real fighter who displayed genuine skill in maneuvering his aircraft. In addition to being a superb pilot, Udet was a self-deprecating cartoonist and caricaturist who was gifted, as gifted with a pencil as he was with a joystick. These are two self-portraits that Udet did. And the one on the left shows him as a lowly NCO pilot in 1915 before he had any victories. Ona abschuss means without victories. And the one on the right shows him after 62 victories with the poor Lemery looking very swank. Um, and these come from a little book that he published in 1928 in 
entitled Hals von Beinbruch, and most many of you know that that's the German aviator's farewell expression, may you break your neck and your legs. And uh, the picture on, whoops. This, this picture shows Uta in his famous Flamingo sports aircraft, and the little verse on the bottom translate, uh, translates as, who is that that flies so early in the morning wind? That's Udet, the happy child. Indeed, Udet was viewed by many of his contemporaries as a childlike, irresponsible person for most of his life, not without some reason. And that brings up a fact that Udet was also a man of many flaws and many faults and many failures. And I wrestled with this a lot as I prepared this presentation. For I don't wish to glorify Udet uncritically. He was an incurable ladies' man, a heavy drinker, playboy. In 1933, he joined the Nazi party and joined the Luftwaffe in 1935. You could say he made a deal with the devil so that he would have access to the latest and best aircraft. After joining the air ministry, he was promoted beyond his abilities. He was promoted to the level of his incompetency, you might say, and made head of aircraft and development production. Unable to deal with problems that were way over his head, he was made a scapegoat by his former friend, Hermann Goering. And by 1941, Udet was a deeply depressed alcoholic and drug addict, and he ended his life, he ended his own life on November 17th of that year. But that's not the Udet I want to talk about today. Uh, rather, I'd like to present a few rare anecdotes of his career during the Great War. As most of you know, Udet published a memoir of his flying experiences in 1935 entitled Mein Fliegerleben, My Flyer's Life or My Flying Life. Only about half of it deals with his career in World War I, so many details were left out. This bestseller was translated into English in Britain, published in Britain as Ace of the Black Cross in 1937. In 1970, a new translation was published in the USA as Ace of the Iron Cross, and it's probably this version that many of you have read. What you may not know, what you may not know is that I can't run this thing. <laughs> what you may not know is that uh, in the summer of 1918, when the war was still going on, Udet wrote his first book, probably dictated it, entitled Kreuzwieder Kokarde, Jagdflüge des Leutnant Udet, or Cross versus Cockade, the Fighter Patrols of Leutnant Udet. This little paperback suffers from wartime censorship and propaganda, but it nonetheless provides information that is missing from his later book. My friend Adam Waite has generously provided excellent translations of portions of this book, and he's given me permission to quote them in this presentation, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, by the way, look at that cover. Copyright infringement? But anyway, Udet's passion for flying began at a young age. As a teenager, he built flying models and even an unsuccessful one-man glider. He was still a teenager. Now, when the Great War began, the 18-year-old Udet attempted to enlist, but was told, no one's going to, no unit's going to take you on. You're not even 160 centimeters tall. It's about five feet three. And, um, nonetheless, he managed to obtain a posting as a motorcycle messenger for an infantry division primarily because he already had his own motorcycle, as seen in the photo. Well, when his motorcycle unit was disbanded, he discovered that the air service was immediately enlisting men who already had a, a pilot's license. So his father, a wealthy engineer, fairly wealthy, paid for Udet's private flying lessons at the Gustav Auto Factory, and he earned his flying license. <coughs> In September 1915, Udet was, by then, a reconnaissance pilot in Flieger op Thailand A-206, an artillery spotting unit, at the front. His observer was Leutnant Bruno Justinius, seen on the left. And you'll note, if you look closely, Udet looks like he's about 13 there. Uh, he was actually 19. After a series of adventures, Udet achieved his dream. He was posted to a fighter unit 
Kampfeinsitzer Kommando Habsheim, or our single seater fighter command at Habsheim. Well, at this unit, he flew Fokker and Faltz Eindeckers, such as this Faltz E4, and later Fokker D2s and D3s. On 18 March 1916, he shot down a French farman for his first confirmed victory. On September 28, 1916, KEK Hopsheim was converted and transformed into Jagdstaffel 15, and Udet became a pilot with that unit, one of the first true dedicated fighter units. On October 12th, and uh, Paul, this, this involves the Lafayette, as you know. Uh, on October 12, 1916, the French Air Service and the Royal Naval Air Service mounted the famous combined bombing raid on the Mauser factory at Oberndorf. And this force was made up of 20 French bombers, 26 Royal Naval Sopwith Struggers, escorted by 12 Newports, some of which were from the Lafayette Escadrille and included Loughberry and Norman Prince. Loughberry got his fifth victory, I think. So Udet was flying a Fokker D3, and he scrambled to intercept this huge bombing raid, and he encountered the bombers over Rustenhart. He wrote, about 20 kilometers behind our front, I observed a formation consisting of seven Breguet two-seaters, which was flying toward the Rhine. It was supposed to be protected by two Newports. Since, since it was flying right below me, my job was easy. I let myself fall past the Newports, innocently placed myself behind the lead aircraft, and after 350 rounds, forced it to land. Since it had landed smoothly, I wanted to prevent its destruction by the occupants, that was very important to German pilots, I landed next to it. And this is the actual Breguet Michelin bomber that would have forced down. They took a lot of pictures of it. As a result of a hit I received in one tire, I tipped over slightly. <laughs> it was a comical image. The captured air crew smoothly landed and the victor with his wheels pointing upwards. The two Frenchmen clambered out of their scaffolding and we shook hands. The pilot was a small stocky man from Nancy. The observer had received a hit in the arm and therefore spoke fairly little. The downed Breguet biplane re revealed about 80 hits, which I determined with some satisfaction. It still had 30 bombs on board. You can see them there. And uh, you can see some of its hits in the, in the nacelle there. It was a pretty good shot. Now help me out here, John. Okay. Uh, Udet continued. The nacelle bore the proud inscription, Le voilà le faudrion, which is that, is that about right, John? Right. Okay. And it translates as, here comes the thunderer, or here comes the destroyer, right? Yeah. So this provided uh, no little amusement for the Germans. One little known fact about Udet is that like von Richthofen, he commissioned a series of silver victory cups engraved with the details of his conquests, at least for his first six victories. In recent years, these six silver cups were sold by a German auction firm, along with some of Udet's personal <coughs> albums and other memorabilia. No, I don't know who got them. Uh, I don't know if there were ever more than six. Uh, Udet scored his first victory six months before Richthofen did. So, no, he didn't copy Richthofen. Uh, Commissioning such memorial cups was, I believe, a fairly common German practice to commemorate any sort of success. And this is the one I just talked about. It's the Breguet Michelin 12, 10, 16. And I don't know what happened to these, but hopefully they're in good hands. Udek earned his officer commission on January 23, 1917. And following his sixth victory, he was requested a transfer to Yasta 37, where he had some old friends. This occurred on June 19, 1917. On July 18, 1917, Yasta 37 was moved to Flanders, opposite the RFC, and the action really heated up for Udet. By September 1917, Udet was flying this albatross D5. And Udet's albatross is superbly illustrated here by Russell Smith in his painting on Morning's Golden Wings. 
the diagonal black and white stripes on the tail. Those were the unit markings of Yasta 37 at this time. And I'm sure most of you know that Udet's personal iconic insignia was the name Lo in large letters on the fuselage. And as I'm also sure you know, Lo was Udet's nickname for his fiancée, which was not only a personal marking, but something of a good luck talisman. And it would grace every one of his wartime aircraft from then on. And his fiancée's full name was Eleonora Zink, not Lola, as it says in Waldo Pepper. Uh, Eleonora Sink. She was the daughter of a wealthy merchant from Nuremberg. And this photo of the young couple, taken in 1920 after they were married, shows that she was indeed quite a stunner. They were married in February 1920, but sadly the playboy Buddha was really not suited to conventional married life. The couple divorced amicably after three years, and they remained friends. She still came to his air shows, things like that. Here's another photo of Udet's Albatross B5, 4476, 17, which he was flying when he attained his 10th victory on 17 September 1917. Your 10th victory was a big deal to the Germans. They didn't call you an ace after, 10, after 5, but after 10 you were, you were kind of getting there. On that day, Udet encountered three DH-5s from number 41 squadron, and it was the first time he'd seen the new DH-5 with its unique backward stagger of the upper wing. And on that day, Udet shot down the Canadian DH-5 pilot, 2nd Lieutenant Robert Taylor, who was killed. I'm indebted to my, my Canadian historian friend, Stuart Taylor, for these photos and the story of Taylor's loss. And again, note the backward stagger on your DH-5. Well, in 1931, Canadian journalist David B. Rogers interviewed Udet in his Berlin apartment. And that resulted in this article in Fawcett's Battle Stories, which was a pulp magazine, and also an article in the Toronto Star newspaper. Rogers asked Udet about the death of his fellow Canadian, Robert Taylor. And this would lead to the family of the late Robert Taylor, the Canadian pilot, making contact with Udet directly. Uh, so we have several accounts by Udet himself describing this combat. I'll quote from all three of them. Udet wrote that the previous night, Yasta 37 had entertained guests until quite late. They probably had a few too many sidecars. <laughs> and the next morning, he had a hangover. And, but he was awakened by his orderly for a morning patrol. He said, I finally got up and stuck my head in the wash basin. I had a fairly bad headache. A splendid remedy for this is a casual morning flight during which the wind can properly whistle around one's head. So I quickly took off before breakfast. I noticed bursts of German flak almost right above me and immediately thereafter three English aircraft. I climbed to their altitude. Now remember, he'd never seen a DH-5 before. At first, I thought they were Sopwiths flying on their backs, upside down, because of the upper wing, which as a rule on all English aircraft is staggered forwards, in this case was staggered backwards. So it must be an entirely new type of aircraft. On reaching 3,000 meters, I attacked these airplanes, which were then flying at about 2,700 meters. I attacked contrary to the usual practice from the front and flew with great speed at the nearest plane, holding my fire until within easy range. After almost the first burst, I saw that I had made a hit and the plane was out of control. A moment later, he crashed. About one and a half hours later, I drove personally in a car to his cell and walked from there to the spot location, first to inspect the new type and secondly in order to establish the name of the occupant. The airplane lay 50 meters west of the road, completely wrecked. This is the photo Uda took of that wreck. With the help of some infantrymen, the body of Lieutenant Taylor was taken from the machine. We took the papers, etc., from the body. Lieutenant Taylor had been shot through the heart and received serious injuries to the head, which was caused by the fall. And in 1931, Udet wrote to Lieutenant Taylor's family. They contacted him first. 
via the Directorate of Graves Registration and Inquiries. Udet wrote, I enclose a large photograph of the remains, DH5 number 9409, that's the photograph we just saw. Of the two identity discs carried by Lieutenant Taylor, I took one away as a souvenir and left the other on the body, which I had wrapped in the tricolor of his aeroplane wing. He cut off the cockade and covered the body with that. I further possessed the map used by Lieutenant Taylor on his last flight in a small silver pocket mirror. I shall be glad to return these artifacts to his relatives, for whom the possession of these must be of far greater value than to me. The burial took place the same evening, quite close to where the machine came down. I'm at your disposal for further details. Yours faithfully, Ernst Budet, Oberleutnant, A.D. I don't know if the Taylor family ever requested the items Budet mentioned, but they did receive the photograph of Taylor's DH-5. On September 27, 1917, Udet was given command of Yasta 37 at the age of 21 and scored his 12th victory the next day. Udet proved to be a popular Staffel commander. And here we see Udet at the extreme left clowning and posing with his pilots. And if you look close, you'll note Udet's standing on a box. <laughs> So he'll be at least approach the height of most of the other men. <laughs> Udet would add nine more victories to his tally in the next three months. Next five months, excuse me. Udet built on the esprit de corps of his unit by expanding the unit markings applied to their albatross fighters. He kept the black and white diagonal stripes on the tail, but he added a completely coal black fuselage. Each, each pilot's machine was identified by a personal symbol in white on the fuselage, such as the swastika there, and the, um, that's a comet on number seven. And each aircraft bore a number on the nose. Udet's own black albatross D5A, however, bore a leader's marking of a white chevron on the nose instead of a number, and his usual low emblem on the fuselage. Udet also had a large white U painted on the underside of the bottom wing. As you can see in this unique photo, uh, and he had streamers tra trailing from the uh, tail plane, that was another leader's marking. Uh, this is a unique shot, it's an actual photo of Udet looping in his Albatross D5A <coughs> taken from above. The U marking helped to ensure that his plane could be identified by ground observers to facilitate confirmation of victories. Well, as you can imagine, the black planes of Yasta 37 made quite an ominous and impressive sight as they flew against the British in Flanders. This is Udet wearing a captured British pilot's leather coat and boots, which were very highly prized by German pilots. Udet's black albatross served him a long time, but, and it had survived many close calls with the enemy. Udet's pictured on thin Gaina airfield in Flanders, now that's not an albatross in the background, that's a black Halberstadt CL2 two-seater which was used as a unit hack and was painted in full unit colors. But anyway, Udet's luck with his black D5A finally ran out, as he wrote. Up to now, a lucky star had constantly shown on me unjustifiably during my aerial combats. There are hits in almost every corner and every extremity of my trusty albatross. In the process, I merely suffered grazing shots, one in my boot, and two in my sleeve, without even getting a single proper scratch. And this is an actual photo of Udep taking off. One day, while flying with a pilot from my Staffel, I allowed myself to be attacked about six kilometers behind our front by three Sopwiths flying higher than we were. The three revealed themselves to be quite cunning customers, and in no time had wrapped up the aircraft accompanying me and sent it home furnished with several hits. When I flew in company with other aircraft in my Staffel, I made it a point of pride in always being the last one in contact with the enemy. So several times I flew around in a circle with my three opponents and apparently shot up one of them quite well when suddenly one of the fellows got behind me unexpectedly in very close proximity and shot at me for all he was worth. I heard hits impacting all around me, rolled my aircraft onto its back, and then let myself spin down. 
at about 3,000 meters, I leveled out again, and with a favorable wind, tried to reach my airfield in a flat glide. In the meantime, I had a look at the mess. All around me, everything had pretty much gone to hell. Both machine guns were put out of action by hits. The windshield in front of my head showed a round hole. The bullet that went through my windshield must have passed rather close to my right temple. Both fuel tanks were riddled, and the benzene was leaping onto my knee like a lively spring. The radiator seemed to have caught a bullet as well, as I constantly sat in a fine shower of water. Once I had noticed that the fuel tank was hit, I immediately switched off the ignition in order to avoid catching fire. When I had slid homewards, haggling with the loss of gravity over the loss of each and every meter of altitude, I found myself a short distance from my airfield. I noticed that I could no longer land in the field with a headwind. So I landed with a tailwind and roared beyond the field at breakneck speed onto a lower line road. In the process, the undercarriage, which due to a hit from a ricochet had lost its stability, collapsed and the result was a complete somersault of my good trusty black albatross. Afterwards, various hits were found in the motor, the fuselage, the wings, and tail surfaces. This was the end of the Black Albatross. Well, in March 1918, with his score of 20, Budek was personally recruited by Manfred von Richthofen to come and join Richthofen's JG-1 fighter wing, which was made up of four separate Yastas. Not only that, but Udek was immediately given command of Yasta 11, the legendary Staffel of Richthofen himself, which had more victories than any other unit in the German army. Udek hated to leave his cherished Yasta 37, but the chance to lead Yasta 11 and fly with Richthofen was too great to miss, so he took it. The painting is by Ernst Bauer and was featured on the front cover of a German young people's magazine called Jugend, or Youth. Remember that portrait. Here we go, Lloyd, Fokker triplanes. Flying this DL-1-149-17 in Yasta 11, Udek quickly shot down an RE-8 and two camels in 11 days to bring his total to 23. However, he came down with a very serious ear infection and Richthofen staying home on leave. When, it was during this time back home in Munich that he was notified he'd been awarded the Blue Max and got the shocking news that Richthofen was dead. His doctor told him that his eardrum was finished and that he was done with flying. But somehow he recovered and returned to the front. Upon his return to JG-1, he was given command of Yasta-4. Yasta-11 later had all but been replaced. So he got command of Yasta 4, which was just re-equipping with triplanes, some of which were handed down from Yasta 6, which was getting V7s. Udet is pictured beneath the wing of Fokker DR1 58617 and some other Yasta 4 pilots. This triplane had previously been flown by the ace Hans Kirstein in Yasta 6, who had it painted up in diagonal black and white stripes, as you can see there. He named this plane his optical illusion the optische Täuschung, and the striping was believed to throw off the aim of any enemy trying to shoot at him. And it was reported that this succeeded, and his machine was only ever hit in the left wing. The only change Udet made in the aircraft's markings was to add his usual low emblem to, to the fuselage. In June, Udet was flying this worn-out triplane, when apparently one of the cylinders detached and ripped off the cowling in flight, tore the middle engine bulkhead. Nonetheless, he managed to make a safe landing. You can see the holes in the bottom surface of the upper wing caused by flying debris. There's one, there's one. See the cowling's completely ripped off. In mid-June 1918, Yasta IV had received some Mercedes engine Fokker D7s, and Udet was flying the plane seen in this classic photo. The most iconic of all his aircraft, the subject of countless illustrations, models, and even full-size flying replicas, right Fred? Uh, like Kirstein's, 
trap plane, it was decorated with diagonal striping on the top wing to create an optical illusion. Buddha added the famous Du doch nicht, legend to the elevator, as a taunting message to any Allied pilot who might temporarily get on his tail. This, this is, and I'm sure you know, this is a, a very idiomatic expression, right, Ted? And it's been translated in various ways. It's, oh, certainly not you, or, you know, like you and his army. Uh, uh, however, there's a lot that remains unknown about this most famous of Udet's airplanes, as this photo, which comes from Udet's book and was heavily retouched for publication, is the only good image we have of it, and as you can see, most of the aircraft is obscured. Uh, the fuselage and the tail were probably red. I believe the striping on the wing was black and white, like his former triplane, not red and white, as usually reconstructed. But at any rate, Uda didn't fly it for long because he was shot down the day after this photo was taken. The story is very well known. On June 29th, flying at 800 meters, Uda attacked a French Breguet bomber. And after his first burst, he noticed that the observer had fallen down and sunk out of sight in his cockpit. Believing the observer was dead or wounded, Uda closed in from the plane's flank, but was shocked to see the observer jump up to his guns, and he loosed a burst that riddled the D-7. Uda's control cables were shot through, and the Fokker plunged down. At only 400 meters height, Uda unbuckled his safety straps and took to his parachute, a relatively new and untried device. And John told you yesterday about the failures they had with parachutes sometimes. And John will recognize this. Uh, these diagrams from one of John's publications, and this is your article, right, John? Yeah. Okay. It shows how the parachute and its static line was intended to work. Udet fell free of the falling plane, but felt a jolt, and was horrified to see that his harness had snagged on the projecting tip of the aircraft's rudder. You know, the, the, the rudder has that balance sticking out, and his harness had caught on that. So he was fastened to a disabled plane that was plunging earthward. He thought about his, his loved ones, he thought about his fiancée, he says in his book, he thought, Low will cry, I think. He thought about his mother. He remembered that he was not wearing his blue max and thought his body would not be recognizable even if it was found. Well, with, with all his strength, he managed to grasp the rudder and bend back the projecting balance tip and suddenly broke free. His chute opened at only 80 meters above the ground. He landed hard, spraining his ankle badly, and realized he landed in the middle of a French bombardment including poison gas shells. He sprinted as well as he could through the barrage, being knocked down twice by flying debris that struck him in the head. He finally took a gas mask from a dead soldier. This photo shows him after he arrived back at his unit. This is the amazing thing. His nerves were still intact, and he flew another mission later that afternoon. <laughs> The next day, June 30th, he received a new BMW engine, Fokker D7-37918, and he used it to shoot down a SPAD for his 36th victory the next day. Well, on July 2nd, Udet encountered an American squadron for the first time, 27th Aero Squadron's Newport 28. A famous combat followed. You can see an artifact from that encounter right here in the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. Udet wrote two different descriptions of this fight, and another was written by his opponent, Lieutenant Walter B. Wanamaker, who hailed from Akron, Ohio. Udet wrote, I was still lying quite warm and cozy in my bed when I suddenly heard flak firing in the vicinity. I ran to the window. I shouted to my mechanic, ready the machine, in the assumption that an enemy formation was approaching. I quickly put on my riding boots and ran, still in my pajamas, to the machine, which my mechanic had prepared for takeoff. I simply pulled on my warm fur combination over my pajamas and took off. I noticed several aircraft at about 3,000 meters height. Upon approaching them, it became clear to me. Two squadrons had bitten into each other, 
eight new ports against seven Germans. When I soon found myself above the swirl of action, I also recognized Lovenhart's yellow machine. Lovenhart, as many of you know, was another very top German ace who flew a yellow Fokker D7, which was just taking care of a Newport. A second opponent, Wanamaker, had used this moment to dive down on Lovenhart from behind. But while doing so, he had not reckoned with the fact that I had in the meantime wended my way up to them in order to put in a word as well. <laughs> and before he knew it, he'd already received several rounds in his engine and fuel tank from me at point-blank range. As a result, he became very confused, immediately went into a dive in a great haste, tried to fly over the river which separated us from the French. I therefore had to set upon him quite energetically in order to dissuade him from this plan. He turned inland again and soon figured out in which direction he could continue his glide without being fired upon by me. That is to say, I only fired upon him when he tried to get behind his lines. As long as he headed inland, meaning into the German lines, I let him glide without being fired upon. During the landing, which occurred about five kilometers behind our front, my client apparently became confused, <laughs> side slipped out of a turn just above the ground, and made a terrible crash. Now, Wanamaker's own memory of the fight was, as usual, somewhat different. There were 11 planes in the German squadron, he, he remembered, against our nine, but we went after them. It was the most thrilling dogfight I've ever seen. I suddenly discovered that a red Fokker was pouring lead into my plane, and I tried to avoid him by going into a tailspin, but I couldn't fool him. A bullet struck my gas tank, and another hit my propeller. Gas rushed into my face, my mouth, and my lungs. Then I tried to go for the French lines, but the man I learned, later learned to be Udet was still hovering over me, still firing. I couldn't make the French lines that way, so I turned and swooped down to the nearest open spot I could find. I don't know how I got out alive, for the plane broke in two at the cockpit. Udet picks up the story. I landed in his vicinity and approached his machine in order to familiarize myself with further construction details of the new Newport. Udet says the Newport still had French cockades, which is possible. When I reached the wreckage, some infantrymen were just pulling the pilot out. During the crash, the man had broken his left leg and had come away with several scratches and bruises on his head, but otherwise he was doing well. I approached him and offered him a cigarette. We greeted each other with a handshake. And when I spoke to him in French, and he wasn't able to answer me in this language, I discovered to my great joy that I had been dealing with Americans today and was now able to make the acquaintance of a member of an American squadron. He introduced himself. Lieutenant Wanamaker, pointed to his thigh with gritted teeth, broken. Well, Wanamaker was then taken off to a German hospital and captivity. As you can see here, Udet then crawled over the wreckage of the Newport 28. This is Udet, right there. He's still wearing his parachute harness, and he's crawling over. This is the fuselage, there's the tail plane and the elevator. Okay. He souvenir cut off the serial number fabric from the rudder as a souvenir. Well, fast forward 13 years to August 1931. Buddha had traveled to Cleveland to perform aerobatic displays at the National Air Races. On September 6th, it was arranged that Buddha would once again meet his old opponent, Wanamaker, who is now a judge living in Akron with his wife, Mildred. It was a highly publicized event covered by radio and print media, Wanamaker, accompanied by his wife, approached Uda in front of the microphones. Hello, Ernest, he said in a very well-prepared speech. Have you ever put on weight? <laughs> and then Uda brought out his surprise. Uda handed Wanamaker the framed piece of rudder fabric from his Newport, which Uda had brought from Germany. Wanamaker was genuinely touched and forgot all about his prepared speech. He said, that's really nice that you would think of this. You know what, he said, when this whole business is over, come and visit us in Akron. My wife and I would be happy, wouldn't we, Mildred? 
And that's exactly what Buddha did. He spent a relaxing evening with the Wanamakers. And then later, Wanamaker or his family donated that piece of fabric in that frame to the, to the museum here. And you can see it's still on display. We have time for one more story? Yes. Do we have time, Mike? Yeah, you got another 26 minutes, Greg. <laughs> well, now back to 1918. Udet received a replacement BMW engine Fokker D7. Uh, D7 423518, very famous plane, which he flew from August until the end of the war scoring close to 20 victories with it. This aircraft was also identified by a red fuselage and leader stringers trailing from the red elevator. I'd like to share one more story with you. In 1919, the French aeronautical magazine, La Vie Alien, had been presenting translated chapters from Udet's little wartime book, Kreuzwieder Kokarde, without the permission of Udet or his publisher. Well, Udet wrote to the magazine in February 1920, stating that he didn't have any objections. He also mentioned his 56th victory over a French pilot of Escadrille Spa 3, the famous Storks squadron, flown by pilot Jean Cayel, who survived as a prisoner of war. Udet had souvenired the Stork emblem from Cayel's downed spad, and in his letter to the editor of La Vie Arienne, Udet offered to return it to Kyle, and that is right here, right there. And uh, Mortan contacted Kyle and had him give his account of his fight with Udet, which is all this part. Okay, so this is Kyle's own account of his encounter with Udet, which is the final story I'll share today. It was the 16th of August, 1918. Oh, apparently, Kyle didn't take him up on the offer of returning the stork insignia because it was still in Udet's study in Berlin in 1936. And that's... There it is, hanging on the wall. And these are all serial numbers from other victories. Each of them can be identified, a cockade. This is the Stork insignia, which was still there in 1936. Okay. Kyle's account. It was the 16th of August, 1918. While leading a patrol, I was abandoned by my comrades. Then I spotted a melee between 15 English planes and 17 Bosch, led by Lieutenant Ludet. I rushed to the aid of the British. I arrived being copiously fired upon from right and left. I brought down one of the enemies in flames, my fourth. I dropped another one but was not able to observe its descent. A Sopwith single-seater was attacked by Udet from close quarters. I rushed over in an attempt to help him out. The poor Englishman appeared to be lost. He emitted a long white trail which soon became worrisome. I turned to extract him from the situation and attacked the German from the front. Udet took up the challenge. The Sopwith availed himself of the opportunity to escape. And then the duel began between myself and the enemy Ace of Aces. It lasted a long time. Neither of us was able to gain an advantage over the other. Then suddenly my propeller stopped, and I had to go into a nosedive. My adversary took advantage of this and stuck to my back like a leech. Coming about, I saw him quite clearly. I ducked my head down as his burst of fire passed over me. His bullet struck my right wing and the stabilizer. Then followed a second volley, and the stabilizer gave way. The support struck flew off, taking with it the stabilizer. The tailplane was coming off. The situation was critical. This was even more true because Ludek was closing in on me, giving the impression that a collision was imminent. But Ludek was still there, no matter how he tried to get away from him. He said Ludek was still there. And I then landed, or rather I just plopped down. He was taken prisoner by a German patrol. He was hiding in a, in, a, in a shell hole. And he actually was so stressed out he fell asleep and the German patrol fired their weapons next to his ear to wake him up. <laughs> they take me to a trench 
where they make me drink some unspeakable wine in order to restore my strength. <laughs> Only the French, right? <laughs> a captured French pilot was taken to a cell in Cambrai, where he was repeatedly interrogated by an intelligence officer, and his boots were stolen. And then, <coughs> one day, my, this is Kyle's account, one day my interrogator was accompanied by another officer. He was my conqueror, Lieutenant Udet. They left soon, and the ace came back alone. We fought fairly, he said to me. So I ask you to consider me a loyal enemy. Don't be afraid. I have no intention of questioning you. I only know that you've been unhappy, and I, and I will try to intervene so that you will not be. He kept his word and did not ask me any indiscreet questions. On the contrary, he gave, me a, he gave me a lot of interesting information. He told me about the parachutes used by the German pilots. He told me he had to use his twice. We don't know really much about the other time. The second time, his plane crashed in French territory while he managed to land in his lines. He gave me an autographed photo, which was later stolen from me. He told me he was going on leave to Munich, and he would fly there in a captured 140 horsepower SPAD, which was his favorite machine for such travels, with which he made all his travels. And I believe we have a photograph of that, but it's not in this presentation. Anyway, he promised me that he would drop a message, he would have a message dropped by one of his pilots announcing that I was a prisoner. As he was leaving, he hesitated. It seemed to me that he was of two minds about offering me his hand. Finally, he held it out, and I held mine towards him. We had no reason to deny ourselves this mark of mutual esteem, since we had faced each other in battle with mutual respect. Yes, admittedly, Udet is the most correct German I've ever seen, although he seems to be an exception among the Bosch. <laughs> in late 1918, Udet's portrait by Ernst Bauer was featured on the cover of the German Young People's magazine, Jugend, the same as Richthofen had been before. Udet's place as a popular German hero is ensured. Thank you very much for listening. about uh, his exploits after he uh, after the war was over. If you've ever been to the Technik Museum in Berlin, I haven't. But they have his uh, they have a box where he had his screws <coughs> and glasses mm -hmm. when he was flying after the war. He was doing all these stunts. He had. Yeah, he had, he had his own mini bar in every plane. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't so mini, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, he was a good friend with my cousin Charles, yep. and then a lot of the air circuses out there were putting on the East Coast and stuff. Yep. I have uh, some articles written about them. Cool. They were doing shows together. And Great. Great. Really Great. good friends. Yeah, he met Rickenbacker. He met René Fonck, uh, was good friends with, with the leading French ace. There's pictures of them walking down the streets of Paris together. And he took Fonck for a, for a plane ride. Um, he met Roscoe Turner and Alfred Williams. And you know he knew everybody in aviation in the 1920s and 30s and was friends with many of his former enemies. Anybody else? <laughs> yes, Charlie. Um, years ago, I remember seeing a movie clip uh -huh. of him flying in the pink flamingo. Is that readily available online or anything? Yeah, there's. You go on YouTube and do a search for Udet, and uh, there's all kinds of videos. Of course, most of you, many of you know, his most famous stunt was somebody would lay a handkerchief on the airfield, and he would come by and dip his wing, just scraping the grass, and pick up the handkerchief off the airfield. And he was in Hollywood, and somebody said, 
could you do that with a car, uh, with, with the handkerchief on top of the car? He said, sure. And they said, if you can do that, we'll give you the car. It was a new Ford or something like that. And a few minutes later, he had a new car. And uh, he met Mary Pickford and Harold Lloyd and just, you know, all kinds of amazing people. He's, he's hard not to like. Um, if you really want to, what are you doing? Uh, <laughs> if you really want to know, um, the best biography of Udet is Fall of an Eagle by Armand van Eyshoven, B-A-N-I-S-H-O-V-E-N. And uh, it was first written in German, it's been translated, it's abridged, but it's still a really good book. You can find it at, at uh, you know, used book outlets and things like that. Uh, Fall of an Eagle. The Life of Ernst Udet. I highly recommend it. it. covers his whole life, of course. Other questions? Yes, John. Is, is there any evidence to indicate that his death was something other than suicide? No, he was suicide. Most, many of you probably know, he, uh, he, was in, he was very depressed. He had a girlfriend named Inga, and uh, he wrote on, the, on his wall or on his headboard, um, Inga, why did you leave me? Uh, Iron One, why have you turned? Why have you betrayed me? Iron One was Herman Goering, right? And uh, his real arch nemesis within the air ministry was Erhard Milch, and he wrote something very uncomplimentary about Erhard Milch. And he, he took his big Mexican Colt. Yeah, I know there's a lot of conspiracy theories. But Yes. Greg, can you go forward one slide? Sure. This could turn into a three-week conversation. Okay. Book or stripe? What? Say again? Book or stripe? Ah, uh, that. <laughs> I think it's it's I think it's photograph retouching. Yeah. If you look at other pictures in the book. The retouching is even more obvious, and the person that did it didn't know anything about airplanes. And there are there's some really weird pictures in there if you look closely at them. What what Mike is talking about? Uh, right there. Uh, Dan St. Abbott was one of the first to to really point that out. And again, it's a published, screened, retouched photo, and people have argued about it and argued about it. So some some artists put the put the bike strike on the top of the fuselage. Um, some don't. Um, I don't think it's anything. But well I I don't think we'll ever know. But any other questions? Yes. What, whatever happened to Lo? She remarried. Um, had some children, uh, I, I think. Uh, I just stumbled across her in a, in a genealogy thing. Um, but she did remarry somebody else. And uh, Udet had lots of girlfriends. Um, but yeah, you, you wish, you almost wish his life would have ended in 1933 or 1935, and, and he never got mixed up with the Nazis and, and all that. So, I mean, he was glad that Germany was powerful again and building its air force. You can't, you can't whitewash that. But uh, everybody that met him in the in the United States or, or in Europe prior to the Nazi era seems to have liked him. You know, just a really likable. But he was a party guy. Yes, John. What did I get wrong? Uh, <laughs> as far as I can see, but the uh, that SPAD 13, that photo, that is Kyle's plane? No. No, I just threw it in there. It's, it's, a, it's a SPA 3 plane. Yeah, and I was wondering... Uh, was... Did I ever send that to you? No. And yeah. I, was... <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if it was Kyle's because uh, the number on the side no, seems not. to be 17, which had been uh, Louis Rizacher's. Yeah. Um, by this... August 18, he was the executive officer of SPA 159. Yeah, this uh, was, uh, belongs to my friend uh, 
Reiner Opsmeyer in Germany, and, and Alan Tolley and I have, and he have, have talked about it. I can send you all that in the correspondence. It was, it was a crash spa three spat, so yeah, I stuck it in there. But, uh, but hey. Uh, but not taken by the Germans? Uh, I think it's behind German lines. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll send it to you. Love to see if I might be able to find out yep, what it is. Yep. Most of the other pictures are actual pictures that relate to Buddha. Questions? Yep. Yes, sir. Tom. Um, I understand that uh, Udit and Manfred uh, were on a patrol together, mm -hmm. and Manfred jumped down and you know beat up an aircraft, and Udit was thinking that no way I'm ever going to get any victory to go to another squadron. <laughs> oh, he he really really admired Ristov. Yes, but and, yeah. when it came to combat, you know. Manfred was the one that uh, took the first crack at it. Well, sometimes. And on one of his first flights with Richthofen, Udet shot down an RE-8 from the front. I mean, attacking from the front. Right. He did that quite often. I mean, that's the kind of pilot he was. And when he got back, Richthofen, this is in the Mein Fliegerleben, Richthofen said, so do you always attack them from the front, Udet? <laughs> well, I've had repeated success that way. So I, they thought a lot of each other. And uh, Buddha says some things in his little book, Kreuzwieder Kokarda, yeah. that you don't find anywhere else. He only knew Richthofen after March 1918, during March and April. And he said his nerves were rock solid. And all the stuff about PTSD and, and all of that, he, he, he really thought. Richthofen believed in nerves. Nerves were more important than, than a good airplane, and uh, he was the prime example of that. He yep. said Richthofen was only upset when he didn't get a good meal, and he lived for eating, sleeping, and, and flying. So, yes, Ted? Oh, only eight more. What? Eight, only eight more. Okay, so <laughs> 62 victories, do you think there were more? Um, probably less, but... Uh, okay. We know of some, I know of at least some, that he uh, he put in for confirmation and he did, didn't get confirmed. Um, the final two, there's there's some disputes. Uh, Yasta 77B put in claims for the same DH-9s and uh, some people say they got double credit from the same planes. So. But he, he was the real deal. You, knowing how thorough you are, Okay, so he's he was from Munich. Have yeah. You, do you know where the house is? Do I know where the house is? No, I don't. I don't know. Is it buried in Munich? I don't. I've never seen anything Very about it. Um, go on YouTube. Udet made a movie called Wunder des Fliegens. Uh, it's a it's it's a propaganda movie to get the German youth interested in flying. It's got incredible footage of Udet flying in the 30s. Um, there are a number of good videos on Udet on YouTube. Um, he was in several movies, uh, SOS Iceberg, The White Hell of Pitz Palu, and uh, Sturm über Mont Blanc. They were all made with Lenny Riefenstahl. And, you know, people claim they had an affair, but who knows. Um, uh, but they, but there were these alpine mountain movies that were made high in the in the Bavarian Alps. In, incredible photography, and and Uda is there doing all his flying, and he's it's just amazing. And he made a movie in Africa. He made a movie in Greenland. Uh, it's it just it's amazing. What else? Did you use the term Oberleutnant A D? Yeah, it means retired. Oh, okay. And then the flight chevron. Yep. How, uh, how early did that show up? Not with just Udet, but was he the first one? No. Okay. <laughs> and then, uh, just a technical question, maybe someone else. How did they fix bullet holes in uh, wood skinned aircraft? Ask Fred. Ask Fred. And then, and finally, Udet, a four letter German name mm -hmm. that's very odd. Do you yeah. know what the origination is? No. 
Okay. His, his mother was Paula Udet, and uh, maybe you can find it. Yes, Tom, explain everything. <laughs> no, but, I Tom. Got, uh, where it says low, mm -hmm. and there is an exclamation point here you don't yep. find on most of the aircraft. Um, at some point, On the earlier aircraft, it's just plain L-O, right. mm -hmm. and the letters are separate. And at some point, he switched to this, and the L intersects the O. Okay. And there's an exclamation point. And Alex Emery speculated that that uh, Signified an even closer relationship. <laughs> 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 Which we won't go into. <laughs> well, Tom wouldn't have seen that except I pointed it out to him. <laughs> Take credit where you credit your name, right? And I'm sure most of you have seen the great Waldo Pepper. Yep. And the character of Ernst Kessler in yep. there is obviously based on Uda. He looks exactly like he did in the yep. 30s. Um, Uda writes that when he was in Hollywood, a director came to him and said, we, we want to do a film on Rick Stoffen. Would you be the technical advisor? And Uda thought to himself, hmm, Rick Stoffen, too big for Hollywood. <laughs> and he said no. And they, you know, they never made it until Von uh, Richthofen and Brown in that awful German movie it came out a few years ago. It's my favorite picture. Yes? Could you tell us about the uh, battle that he had with the famous French when his gun was jammed? Ah, if Russ was here, we could spend a, an hour on that. Uh, in, in his book, how much time do we have? Well, okay. five, five minutes. Okay. In his book that he wrote in the 30s, Mein Pflegerleben, he, I, I knew somebody would ask about that. He writes this famous account where he fights with Guinemere, and he knows it's Guinemere because he can read Vo on the fuselage as in Vo Charles. Yeah. And he believed Guinemere had already killed one of his squadron mates, and they're going round and round and round, and Udet's guns jam. And he's hammering on them and pulling at the cocking handles and hammering on them. And, Uda, and Guinemere flies over him upside down and looks down, sees that Udet is helpless. And Guinemere waves at him and flies away. <laughs> now, that's very famous. Russ did a magnificent painting of it. I don't know if it ever happened, really. Uh, it would be nice to believe that it did. Uh, he said nothing about it in his earlier book, in Kreuzfeder Hochard. But uh, if you're writing a book during wartime and it's you know it's a propaganda book, you're not going to say, "Well, the, the greatest French ace had me in his mercy and he let me go." <coughs> you're not going to pay that tribute to the enemy. But um, that became it became a famous sort of theme in, in World War I aviation. You see it in Wings, 1927. One of the Americans is hammering on his jams guns and the German ace waves and flies off. And you see it again and again in enemy ace comic books and, and, and movies. And, and uh, Lothar von Richthofen said and told more than one person that um, he had jammed guns and a British pilot he was flying, fighting waved and flew away. Um, and that predates all of the Udet stories, so maybe Udet got it from him, I don't That's the first account I can find of that, and it becomes a very famous theme. We can talk about that anytime. But thank you so much for listening. I hope you